an analytics process and uh, hopefully highlights the, the power and sophistication and kind of capabilities that we can do within Spark. Um, the entire demonstration today will be done on top of our data science work experience. Um, the data science experience is a really nice portal and I'll walk through it quickly to kind of show uh, how it can be used for collaboration for data scientists and uh, data analysts. Um, that sits on top of our Bluemix environment. So um, if I step over to Bluemix really quick, if you're not familiar with it, it's where we have our SaaS offerings for a, a number of different uh, technologies. So today, again, I'm going to focus a little bit on Spark and the capabilities there. Um, but it's worth noting on Bluemix, if you, if you log in, you can set up a 30-day trial. There's really a vast uh, amount of different applications that you can you can leverage and take advantage of whether it's um, you know like from from this perspective you can you can see all the data and analytics tools that are available um, we're going to leverage Apache Spark today which is um, really Spark as a service that abstracts and takes away all the infrastructure stuff um, but you can see there's just a ton of different tools um, database technologies um, also for application development if we you know, things like uh, Node or um, even taking advantage of a lot of the different Watson APIs. So you can go in and um, take advantage of um, text analytics or uh, some of the cognitive stuff that we have built in there. So just be aware that that exists and that's kind of the, the engine that's powering the majority of the demo today. Um, and then around that, what we have for the data scientists, if you go to data science, Dot IBM com, you'll get to um, to this data science experience portal, um, and it it provides a collaboration tool, and it's really designed and geared towards the way that most analysts and data scientists work. Um, so when you lo first log in, you get a, a view of all the uh, you get a view of, of different articles, data sets, um, sample notebooks. So really great learning opportunity here to work with different um, different technologies and, and leverage and learn Spark and, and R and the different ways to analyze data. Um, and the, of course you can filter down and go to you know specific articles that may be relevant. Um, it's, it's kept very up to date. Like you can see here we have a blog posting that's uh, weekly for kind of this week in data science. In the data sets, which is always a nice thing to have to to work with and have something to play with um, as you're learning these different technologies. These are really nice uh, public data sets that are available that are fairly well documented. Um, there's, there's an explanation of the data itself, an explanation of the columns, and then you can easily pull these into and, and leverage them in your, um, your notebooks, your analysis as you, as you move forward. So um, also within the data science experience, you can see um, that I have projects, uh, connections, I have R Studio capability, and the, the ability to manage uh, my object store. So if I look at um, my projects, for example, we'll jump into the NFL one we're going to work with today. You can see that I have a number of notebooks that have been created for different, um, different analysis, and we'll walk through three of these today. And then you have the data assets. So I can actually pull in data objects and group them into this specific project. And then I can create bookmarks to those uh, tiles that you saw on the front page, whether it's a related tutorial or a related data set or a related article that might have something to do with um, this specific project. Um, and then you can also see the analytics assets or notebooks and, and pipelines. And one other nice tool in here is that you have collaboration. So I can actually take a project and I can add collaborators to it. I can create read-only viewers like um, Aisha is here, or I can go in and create actual editors like Jim who can come in and actually contribute and change the content and overall change the project. Um, and it's really nice when they log into the data science experience, if I've added them as a collaborator, this automatically shows up under their projects. Um, and so it gives a nice, um, simple way to collaborate and work on these, um, these different technologies together. 
Now, like I said, there's also the capability to work within our studio in here. Hopefully this pops up. Um, the, our studio gives you the full IDE for uh, leveraging R and then can connect to those different data sources and um, the Spark engine and everything else that exists in the background as well. So really a very rich um, environment for uh, collaborating and doing analysis and, and deeper data science type operations on, on your existing data sets. So we're going to start, we're going to step through three notebooks today. The first one is engineering. We're going to kind of go through an ETL process. Um, you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's not necessarily targeted at best practices. It's really to show off the capability and the types of operations that we can do within Spark. Um, and hopefully you walk away kind of seeing some of the power of, of where Spark can really lend itself well to ETL-like operations. And then I'm going to jump into the NFL analysis one where we do some nice visualization and we do some kind of simple um, statistical analysis to kind of determine um, some player out outputs. And then just for the fun of it, because the Super Bowl is this weekend, um, I went through and put together a couple of simple graphs and some analysis on, um, on the Patriots and the Falcons um, kind Brayden? of compared. Yes. We have a question about the data sets. Um, <clears throat> we have someone asking where uh, the data set, the NFL data is from. Oh, great question. Um, and so let's, let me jump into engineering and I'll, I'll explain that real quickly. And actually I have this sheet up here. So the, the data set itself that I pull is, um, there's a GitHub repository called NFLDB. Um, by a guy named Bernd Sushi. And so if you go to um, GitHub and we look for Bernd Sushi. Uh, uh, so Bernd Sushi slash NFLDB on GitHub. Um, this is an amazing database. Um, so he actually ends up populating and using a Postgres database in the back end that contains the last five or six years worth of NFL statistics. Um, and the grain is really small. It actually goes down to individual players, um, individual plays in a game that you can um, get all the way back to the player. So you can do the analysis of a player for a play. And I'll show an example of how we do um, some Russell Wilson throwing in one game um, to kind of map out the yards, but good question. And you know, much thanks to Bernd Sushi, it's, uh, <laughs> he's, he's made this immensely easier. Um, the other nice thing is this database, he has uh, instructions in here on how to update and keep it current. So after each week, you, you can easily go in and run a little process to keep it current. Okay, so, um, whoops. Engineering. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, um, first we're going to extract some data. We're going to pull the data from the Postgres database that I mentioned a second ago from uh, Bernd Sushi NFLDB. We're going to scrape Wikipedia and we're going to pull some information from there um, for some metadata around the stadiums. And then we're going to pull weather data for each of the games for the, the relevant um, the games that we have. Um, we'll go through and do some simple transformations. Um, one of those, we're going to have to pivot. Um, we'll also marry the metadata to the game data, and then we'll incorporate the, the weather data as well. And then ultimately at the end, we'll all end up loading it. Um, I just persisted to the local file system as Parquet. Um, easily could have been written to a database or an object store, um, exported to anything, CSV or any, any kind of output that we want to work with. I'll show a quick example of that. Um, right, and I think there's there's another question that is worth uh, clarifying now, and it's um, about the relationship between data science experience and Bluemix, and whether okay. if someone has a Bluemix account, can they access these notebooks? Uh, so just a little bit of general overview on how this is set up. Yeah, you bet. So, so the data science experience itself for the Spark component requires a Bluemix account and requires a Spark instance that's running inside of Bluemix. So if you already have Bluemix and you have Spark as a service, 
when you log into the data science experience for the very first time, it will ask you where, um, which Spark instance in your Bluemix account you want to use. So it's all linked together. Um, if you go to the datascience.ibm.com, you can sign up for a free 30-day trial. If you don't already have a Bluemix account, it'll walk you through that process as well. So it'll just stand up a Bluemix account and stand up that first Spark as a service. Does that help, Anna? Is that clear? Yeah, and it's the Bluemix account. Uh, is there a freemium version or is it just a trial? Yeah, uh, so the, there's a, the login will always be free, but the different services have different different components. So I think the Spark service itself is, uh, is just free for 30 days or it's just a trial. Um, beyond that, there is a small personal edition that's very, very inexpensive. Um, and then there's a enterprise edition that scales up that, where we'd actually get you know into the power of Spark and, and the ability to add. Um, I think those come in buckets of 30 executors. Um, so, so quite a bit more power. Does that answer it? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, of course. All right. So the workflow today on the ETL one is um, grab the NFL DB data. Um, I'm going to normalize that data. I'll explain how that comes through, kind of denormalized. Um, I'm going to pull out the distinct games, and then I'm going to marry that to some or to the Wikipedia data, and ultimately go out and get the weather. And then I'm going to build a table or a, uh, a record set that has all of the weather data. Um, and then at the end of this notebook, I'm just going to persist all of the normalized games, and I'm going to persist all of the the weather data that I've pulled for each unique game. So the, the first step is to ensure that I've got my uh, Postgres driver. Um, one nice thing within these notebooks is that you can just run an exclamation mark and it will, and then any command after that is going to run on the, um, the operating system that the notebook's hosted in. So in this example, what I'm doing is I'm just running a simple wget to pull that Postgres jar and um, so that it's available to me. And then what I can do within Spark is just create a very simple reader using JDBC. Um, this example happens to be a Postgres database that's hosted on top of Bluemix. And you can see there where I'm specifying all my connection properties to get to that database. And then um, in Spark, it's as easy as connecting to the data and then registering my, my data frame as a specific table. And once I do that, it's successful via Spark SQL. The other nice thing that you can do within these notebooks, you'll see the toolbar up here. Um, of course, this is timed out. But you can see up here when I hit the 1001 um, that I have the ability to insert code for, um, for the different data frames. So I can say, you know, insert a pandas, a Spark SQL data frame, or just insert the credentials to get to these different data objects. And then I have the same capability with my Dash DB or my Postgres connections that are configured. And so this is a, ultimately what gets put in if I just specify the credentials. Um, so I can just insert that code nice and easily and, and not have to mess around with um, remembering all my connection properties for every single notebook. And then in this example, I use another, um, a, an actual SQL query that I put, throw at Spark SQL to create a new data frame and to create um, the, the table, the player table itself. So it's really just to kind of highlight another example of how to get to this data. Um, the other thing I'd say is if, um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but all of the notebooks are available if you go to, um, my GitHub repository is Braden RC, and then there's an NFL DSX project within there. Um, this note, all three of these notebooks are posted, and you're, you're welcome to go peruse them and um, kind of go through them slower later if you're interested. Okay, so now that I have my game data frame, I just pull a simple count. Um, we've got about 2,600 games that we're going to do. Uh, we're going to play around with some analysis on. Um, I can also pull, this one's pulling through and create a team data frame. And then this is straight from that Burnt Sushi uh, repository. It shows the, um, 
the entity diagrams for the specific tables that are available to us from there. And now what we can do is within these notebooks, there's I'm going to show you a couple different ways to do some visualization today. Um, the first and kind of simplest one is that I can just use pandas and matplotlib, and that just does some. They're they're nice and simple and easy to visualize, and then later on I'll show Brunel, which is a little bit richer. Um, it uses D3 stuff. So in this example, um, we can just run a simple select statement against the um, the player table that I created from above. Um, in this example, we're just seeing who contributes the most to uh, which college contributes the most players to the NFL by count. And then you can see. Here, where I say uh, matplotlib in line, I'm simply just saying I want uh, the output of the charting to display within the notebook itself. And then I can import those libraries and simply plot. And then you can see the output. And um, we see Ohio State, LSU, and Miami, or, and USC are kind of the top four contributors of players to the NFL within my record set, which again, I think is about five or six years worth of, uh, of the NFL data. Another nice thing, if you've worked with, um, and you'll see some JSON examples here later, later where they're, this is actually um, nested, but it's really nice to be able to go in and print the schema. Um, so I have the ability to take those data frames and simply spit out the schema. Um, if the data is typed, it will actually show what the guess typing is, or if it's, um, if it's strongly typed, it'll show that as well. Um, but it gives me a nice uh, visualization and a kind of a reminder what, what data exists in here. Um, and then just from an ETL perspective, just trying to get a sanity check, um, running a count of games by season year, just to verify that I don't have any anomalies or I'm not missing a year or something's um, off with the data. Um, and you can see we're pretty consistent for the count of games per year. Okay, so one of the things that happens with this data set is that I have a, in the games table, I have a row that represents every game. And within that, I have the home team and the away team as separate columns, and then the winner, the loser, et cetera, is all represented on one row. And it's fairly flat and hard to do an analysis if I want to run uh, analysis grouped by team. And so this kind of highlights the power of being able to marry not only the Python stuff, which I'll show later, but the ability to marry the, the Python and the Spark API as well as incorporate some fairly um, nice SQL stuff. So in this example, the the ability to pull out the winners, or excuse me, the home team, and then union it to the away team can give me this nice normalized list. And it's a fairly simple and easy to read SQL statement um, that's easier to express here than it would be in a, um, a language like Python. And so um, you can see here where I just pull this big select statement. I also have the ability at this point to augment the data and add some additional columns so I can create my one and my tie uh, columns based on these simple case statements. And then I can, again, I can simply union this to all the data from the OA team and I get this nice normalized table that represents all of my game data, but every row now, now represents a team and the game they've played on that given week. And then I can start to do some simple exploration of that data. Um, so, for example, if we just take the most winningest team by the sum of wins um, and then group it by team and plot that out. Unfortunately, we can see the Patriots up there at the top. Um, but nevertheless, um, you can see it, it kind of tapers out. Um, obviously, LA, which this makes sense, right? LA hasn't been um, in existence. Um, for the majority of the last five years, and so they kind of fall off the bottom. Um, so again, quick, simple visualization to try and see if I've got the shape and the, the format of the data is what I would expect to see. Okay, so now I'm pulling some uh, team metadata. So we have the Postgres um, table with team that has some of the information. Um, we're ultimately going to go pull weather, so I need to be able to marry the team information back to the games and then ultimately pull the weather for each of those games. Um, so one of the things that's missing, you can see in the team data, is that I have the city that it's in, but that's not enough information for the, the, weather, um, the weather channel API. I actually want to throw a latitude and longitude 
of the stadium at the Weather Channel API to ultimately pull back that information. So what we can do is right in line, again, because we have the ability to leverage Python, is if we can build a quick little scraper right inside the notebook that goes out to the Wikipedia page and pull the latitude and longitude. So this is just a subset of what exists on that Wikipedia page. Um, and I know it's probably hard to read, but if you look at the coordinates, you can see I've got the latitude and longitude of each of the stadiums for each of the teams. Um, so I leverage beautiful soup here. Um, I go out and pull from that web page. I have uh, a simple little um, parser that goes through and finds that table with the latitude and longitude, um, parses it out. I also have a simple little function that just does, um, that cleans the string. The string, some of the string data has, you know, asterisks and a bunch of stuff that I don't want in it. Um, but ultimately what I end up with is a nice little Python list, um, stadiums L, that contains the team, the city state, the name of the field, and most importantly, the latitude and longitude of that particular team's uh, location. And then the other thing that I don't have in there is I don't have whether or not the stadium itself is, has a roof or whether it's open. Um, so there's another list of um, stadium and stadiums that exist on Wikipedia. And in this example, what I'm, I do the exact same thing, but the table that I pull um, has a little bit more information. So I've got the name of the stadium and whether or not it's open or a retractable roof. And then I can marry all of that data together and ultimately end up with the latitude and longitude of each of these stadiums and the roof type of each of these stadiums. And once I have that, I can, this is a great example on how I can take a Python list and turn it into a Spark data frame and ultimately a Spark table. So a lot of times we think of Spark as these great big data sets and it certainly handles those really well, but often we have metadata that we want to bring in and we want to marry it to the, to the record set. Um, so this is just a simple example in showing that. And so what we do is we just take the stadiums, um, the stadiums data that I care about, which is the, in this example, I pulled field type, latitude, longitude, roof, stadium city, stadium name, and the team. So I can ultimately marry it back to my game data. And so I just pull those subsets from the Python list, and then I create a stadium data frame that's associated with those specific values. And you can see right here, we're actually going and creating each individual row for each of those data sets. And then once I've created my Spark data frame, I can simply, um, I just pull out the first couple of rows to show an example, or I can pull out the entire table. And if I spit it to pandas within a notebook, it automatically renders as a nice readable table. So you can see that I've got hopefully 32 um, zero through 31. So I've got 32 uh, stadiums, one to represent the relationship with each team. And then you can see the roof types there where I've got open, retractable, fixed. Okay, so one of the nice things that you can do within Spark SQL is that you can create Python functions or Java or Scala, and you can actually call those functions within your SQL code. And so in this example, what I do is I've got, um, I want to pull out just a subset of the team name in order to marry it to the name. And if you look at here, you'll see um, the team names that I have, like Minnesota Vikings or Arizona Cardinals. When I go and run the join to the, my burnt sushi data, the team name is only represented as Cardinals, Vikings, Bears, Broncos, et cetera, right? Or Buccaneers for that matter. And so what I do is I just create a simple little helper function that get last string. And it basically goes through and it looks for the furthest string to the right strip by, or where we split it by the spaces. Um, luckily, every NFL team is a single name. And so I can just cheat and kind of pull that last value. And then I can register that function within SQL context, um, which makes it available to my Spark SQL. 
So in this example, I just keep the names the same and I pass get last string function and name it get last string. And then what you can see is that when I run that, um, when I when I go back and I join my stadiums and then the, remember the team table came from Burn Sushi, now I can just simple a simple join between those two based on the function that I just created. And now I have the team ID for Burnt Sushi, which is the primary key to um, get back to my game data, and I can marry it to all this other rich data with my latitude, and longitude, and root type. And then I can pull out each of the distinct games. So this is just an example of pulling out the distinct games. And then you can see here, the other thing I do is I add a filter at this point where I say the lower roof is equal to open, because that's all I care about. So I get every game, the start time, the stadium city, the latitude and longitude, and the roof type, and then the location that is the key that ultimately marries back to um, the team data. And then, so this is just an example here where I'm pointing out the first 10 records of that query. And then I take that exact same query and actually create a new data frame called distinct games data frame and um, then register that as distinct game. And now you can see I get 1,972, which represents every unique game that was played in a stadium with an outdoor roof or an open, open stadium, I should say which is ultimately the weather analysis that we want to do. Because the assumption is weather in a dome doesn't matter to the game. Okay, so now we can go out and get the weather data. Um, there's a couple of steps we're going to have to go through here. Um, we're going to have to create a function to parse the game ID. Um, the, the game ID itself contains the date uh, value that I can ultimately pass to the weather API to get the weather for that date. Um, but I need to do some conversions, some kind of simple stuff there. Um, and then I'm also going to create a function to get the weather data. That takes the date, the latitude, and the longitude and returns back to me a JSON blob that represents the weather for that specific day. Um, so you can see, again, I use a simple creation of the function. I regist register that function within um, for Spark. I can create a new data frame. Um, in this example, what I'm doing is I'm taking the data frame, and instead of a SQL statement, I'm expressing this within the Spark API. I use a function called with column, and I can add an, um, I can add to the distinct games data frame. I add a new column called date key that for every row will run that function parse date key UDF and pass it the value of GSISD, uh, GSISID, I'm sorry. And so ultimately what I end up with is a copy of the distinct games data frame with an appended column called date key that makes it easy to go back and, and run the weather data. Um, and then I can register that data, that new data frame as a table so that I have the ability to access it via SQL. Um, and then I just pull out the first five rows. And you can see an example of the actual data set. And then you can see my nicely parsed date key in here that gives me the year, the month, and the day. Um, I set a variable equal to my weather API key. And then I'm going to create another function that takes the date string that I just created, my latitude and longitude, and it returns back to me the URI that I need to, um, that I can call to get uh, the, the REST API from uh, weather, the weather channel. And so you can see the function or the, how the URI is actually built. It takes the latitude, the longitude, and then takes a, a certain format of the start date that has to be padded. And that ultimately will return back to me a uh, JSON blob that, that contains that weather. Um, so what's kind of neat here is that I have, I mean, it's not super complicated, but I have a fairly complicated operation to go out and call the REST API, pull back data, and return this data set. 
And then I can simply express that as this function called get weather. And right within Spark, all I have to do is call, and you can see right here when I create this data frame, that all I have to do is call weather. Um, I, I create a column called weather that's equal to that function passing all of that data. And I could have expressed this in SQL. I could have said select um, select get weather and then pass those three columns to it. Um, but just for the sake of showing many different approaches, in this example, I actually use the map. And what it, the map operation itself will, will take the existing values and then append to it this function with this data. And then I can register that as a distinct games weather table, and then I can print out the schema. And one thing that's interesting with this particular schema is now that we have a key value pair which exists within that JSON block for the weather, you can actually see that it's nested inside of that column of the weather column itself. And then you have the, the original columns that exist for that table shown there. And then if I just pull out the first five rows to kind of show an example, you can see over on the right we have a map, which is that JSON blob, and then those existing tables that exist. And if I pull a count, um, obviously here I should match what I had up above with the 1972, just to make sure, again, just kind of a, a checkpoint to make sure that I've got the count of tables that I would expect. So at this point, what I have is I have a data frame that represents the weather for each distinct game, and I have the normalized games uh, data that I ultimately want to persist and be able to do some analysis on. So I stop here with the ETL operation. Um, I go through and quickly just remove any of the Parquet files that might exist if, if they are there. Um, I've run this 100 times, so there normally is data. And then I can go through and I can just say, um, take the, the data frame itself, write it. Um, I choose my output in this example as Parquet, and then I just write it to the local file system since they're fairly small record sets. And um, ultimately dump this Parquet data inside of um, the file system. And in the next notebook I'll jump into in a second, you'll see in the analysis notebook, I can just quickly go read it and then start, start from this point forward. Um, a couple of things to note is I could certainly come in here and I could schedule this notebook to run periodically. So if I'm updating my database once a week, I could schedule the notebook just to execute the entire thing once a week, keep it up to date. Um, I also have the ability to come in here and share the notebook. Um, so within share, I can share it um, via gist or I can send people a URL directly to it. Um, and what else? And then I have, um, so right now the view that we're looking at is the read-only view. We can come in and edit it as well. Um, and there's also a version history here. So I can go in and create checkpoints um, with, as I'm developing the notebook itself. And I can show you an example of that in analysis in one second. Um, and I'm sorry, one, one last thing on the persistence. Not only can I persist to the file system, I can also use the credentials like I had before and persist it via JDBC to a specific uh, table. So if I want to write that into that Postgres database that I had before, I can certainly do that as a, as a net new table. Okay, let me pause there for just a second. Um, Anna, do we have any questions? There's Right on. Uh, there's there's a question that I have, but it's uh, it's more general, and it's asking about the difference between um, a Jupyter notebook and a Zeppelin notebook. Okay. I'm not sure if that's something you can address. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the so they're just the simple way to say it is they're just two approaches to taking the exact same thing. Um, we happen to leverage the Jupyter, this is Jupyter Notebook that I'm showing in, in all of these examples. Um, I don't know if we'll have Zeppelin in this environment at some point. I, I kind of hope so. Um, there's pros and cons between the two of them. 
Um, the, Jupiter tends to be a little bit more portable and a little bit more um, commonly used on a lot of the different cloud platforms. Um, Zeppelin gives you some really nice inline ability to write um, SQL and Scala and Python all kind of within one notebook by just specifying which interpreter to use when it runs. So um, the, the realistically, the best way to, to get a feel for it is to use both of them. Um, but at this point today, the Jupyter environment is the only one that's supported by the data science experience. Any other questions? Yes. Um, another question is, is the notebook integrated with IBM Node-RED? With IBM what? Node-RED? Node-RED. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that one. I can follow up, though. If you get their contact information, I'm more than happy to figure that one out. Perfect. Uh, we'll get back to, to you with that, with that answer. Now, uh, the next question is uh, if we can get the sample code with instructions, and, and uh, that's definitely something that we can send um, yeah. with the email that goes out with the link to the recording. So, so that's, that's um, perfect. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Well, feel free to ask as I'm, as I'm going through it, and I'll pause at the end as well um, just to make sure that we get them tackled. So. Um, and then the code thing, just one more time, Braden RC slash uh, NFL DSX on GitHub will get you to the code. But we'll, we'll put that in the email as well. Okay, so let me step through the analysis kind of quickly. There's nothing super profound in here, um, but again, the goal here is to show some visualization and show a couple of kind of simple approaches and some of the power of what we can do with this part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab those Parquet files that we we just created, and then I'm also going to connect to the Postgres database, and I'm going to pull out some simple record sets to go through and do some fairly simple analysis. Um, you can see, just like I wrote, the uh, syntax is almost the same for reading those Parquet files. Um, I create two data frames, one's the weather, one's the normalized data, and then I can also, in kind of one fell swoop, go through and pull all of the different um, database tables that exist in that Postgres environment. Um, just for some simple kind of sanity checks, um, you can we'll pull out the games, we can pull out the distinct games of the weather data. Um, just simple counts here to kind of get some perspective of what I'm working with. Um, you can see the games, the weather one matches up perfectly with what the other notebook did. Um, the games is uh, roughly double the total games that I pulled through in the first one because we've normalized that table. Um, and some pretty staggering things like player plays. There's a um, there's a million player plays. When you take every play times every player, there's a, there's a million records in that table. So it's you know not huge, but it, it, it certainly grows. Um, the other nice thing I can come in here and just quickly print out the schema. You saw this in the other notebook, um, but it gives me a nice reference point to jump back to and start look at these different columns that are available to me. Um, you can see how rich this data is within the um, player plays table and just a ton of statistics. It's just a phenomenal database of, um, to kind of play with if you're, if you're interested in doing this further. Um, and then plays themselves, players, et cetera. Okay, so we can take one game and um, we'll take Russell Wilson, since I'm a big Seahawks fan, and we'll look at the passing yards for one particular game and I've used that as an example to do some visualization and simple analysis. So what I can, this, this query itself shows how powerful um, or how kind of common it is, a better way to say it with Spark SQL, I can express a join to three different tables, I can create a simple where statement um, and order and group that data. And ultimately what I end up with is um, using that same matplotlib charting that we had before, um, you can see this particular game, and you had a couple of big plays and you know, lots of um, you know, maybe rushing plays or defensive plays where he wasn't involved. And then I can take that exact same data set, and I can, I, I can now visualize it inside of Brunel. So in line, we have this capability to run Brunel. 
um, the visualization, the charts themselves are rendered in D3. Um, so if you're familiar with that, it gives you a nice, rich, um, more interactive. Um, you can see that I can zoom, maybe, um, I can zoom in and out of the chart itself and get to a better perspective. Um, so that's, again, just kind of taking that same, that same data set that we had before. All I need to do is pass it the data frame, a pandas data frame, which is um, in this case an aggregation, and then tell it how I want it to render and what the x and y coordinates are. And, uh, we have a question about uh, the data frame, distinct games, weather, DF, and the question is, uh, this data frame has a nested structure schema. How to show that nested data to the lowest level? Okay, so there's, I'll show an example um, in the analysis where we actually start to pull in some weather. If that doesn't tackle it, let me know. Um, the other thing is, is that you can actually um, reference it by a, by a dot. And so if, um, depending on how the, the subset of data worked, I could have a column dot the nested column, if you will, and that would pull that value as well. Um, this one's slightly more complicated because it's, it's effectively a dictionary. Um, and I'll, I'll show the example of how I pulled that. Okay, um, this takes the exact same data set that we were just playing with, but this time um, we order it by the play ID, and then um, we can show the sum of total yards. So this is showing the running total of yards um, for that particular game through the, prog through the progression of the game, um, specifically as he's throwing. Then we can use um, we can use a join to go out and pull the player data. Um, so this one's kind of fun, where we're going through and we're pulling the top 15 uh, throwers in the league for the entire data set that we have. So if we look at the last five six years of data, who's thrown the most yards? Um, and you can see now we're getting into a slightly richer um, presentation. Um, this time I actually transpose throw a transpose at it so that we get um, a horizontal bar chart instead of vertical, um, and then you can see the, the different throwers. Um, and you know, as we would expect, right? We see Drew Brees way out in front, Aaron Rodgers, um, Rivers, funny enough, and um, Tom Brady kind of sitting out in front the most. Okay, we can also determine the most passing yards by team with a count of quarterbacks. So it's interesting to see something simple like the overall most, you know, most prolific passer, if you will, in the NFL for that record set. But what about teams? And then for each of the teams, how many, how many players themselves actually contributed to that? And the point here really isn't that this is profound information. It's just showing that the SQL capabilities are fairly rich. I can pull sums and counts. I can run these, you know, simple joins between them. Um, I can group it. I can pull out just the top 15 if I order it correctly, et cetera. And then I can visualize that as well. And this isn't the best visualization, but you can see where I come in and actually marry a couple of different Y values um, where I'm taking account of the players and it's this small red line. I can kind of zoom into it so you can see it. But it's a small red line that represents the players per team, whereas the bar itself represents the let me get this back, where the bars themselves actually represent the uh, total yards for that given team. Um, and not surprisingly, we see you know Drew Brees being the most thrower and probably one of the healthier uh, quarterbacks than being out in front. Okay, so now I can pull through um, some data, and hopefully this answers the question that just came up with how do we pull that nested data. Um, so leverage the JSON library, and then if we pull out one column of the um, distinct data frames, this is actually what the weather data looks like. So um, we can pull through the row weather, and then we're pulling through that observations um, the observations is part of that nested JSON data, and I can dump out one observation. And you can see that it's a big key value pair that represents all kinds of weather statistics. Um, it's 
snow and rain and wind and everything, temperature, obviously, and all those things. So what I do in this example, um, for simplicity's sake, is that I created just a simple little helper function in Python called get the weather metric. And I just picked arbitrarily the, um, the middle observation. It could be anything, um, but I didn't get too fancy with time. So I just go in and I, I grab um, the 10th observation. And then if I pass the data blob, the JSON blob itself, and then I tell it which specific metric I want to work at, what I have it do is I have it actually go through and parse out and return to me the measure for that specific observation. Um, and if we get an error, I just have to return it an NA. And then I can register that as a SQL function like I've done quite a few times at this point, um, get W metric. And then in this example, I can just say select get W metric. I'm saying temp for the give me the temperature for that weather column. So I pass that weather column as a JSON block back to it. And what you see is I get a nice simple return of all the temperatures um, for that specific observation within that time. Um, I, you could also pull in the example I was trying to say before is I could say weather dot observations and it would actually pull back that observation data. Um, but since there's one for each hour, um, I went and built the, I built the simple parser to get exactly what I wanted out. Okay, and then uh, so in order to make the analysis just easy to run the rest of the visualizations. Um, I go through and just pull the six or seven uh, weather metrics that I think are probably most common for us to do the analysis across. Um, so I create a new data frame with my weather metrics um, so that I don't have to parse them. And then you can see I pull the temperature, visibility, precipitation, heat index, uh, wind speed, total precipitation, and the pressure. Um, and then here's what that data actually looks like. Um, this is just pulling top five rows, and then you can see over to the right um, a nicer visualization. Again, in the notebooks, if you just dump out to pandas or you call pandas data object, um, it gives you this nice, simple table view of the rendering. And now what we can do is we can look at the average temperature and the average wind speed. Um, so in this visualization, I take the average temperature and chart it out, and then not sure what happened with my chart here, but um, you can see Green Bay plays in the coldest weather and all the way over to Tampa Bay playing in the warmest weather and Miami, Jacksonville, kind of as we would expect. Um, but a nice, simple visualization of those teams. And then this is kind of a neat capability within Brunel is I actually have the ability to go in and create buckets. Um, and so what I can do is I can say I want to create and this one, I actually bin it into, um, I think, 15 bins and say, for each of the teams, bucket them together based on the average temperature that they play in, um, and then just rank them. And what you can see is there's, what, it does a nice job of kind of pulling outliers. So you see Tampa Bay is, is an outlier, Jacksonville, Miami are, um, you know, closer. They play in roughly 68 to 70 degree weather on average. Um, and Green Bay is a big outlier, playing in, you know, 50 to 52 degrees. Um, but you get nice buckets, and then you can also see, you know, the majority of the teams kind of here in the middle, um, where Baltimore and Buffalo are playing in, you know, 56 to 60 degree weather. Um, but a nice way to create those simple bins. And then we can also do a scatter chart, where we come in and we actually take the wind speed and the temperature. And again, this one, you know, it's kind of show the capability of the visualization. In this example, we can get um, quite a bit more elaborate where we get start to get some interactivity. So I can go create a tooltip, they can get those specific values out. Um, you can see I've got the colors that are built on each of the specific teams. Um, you can also set size on these dots to be representative of, you know, we could have done average yards a year or something like that. Um, but nice simple visualization that gives me some power and is a little bit more um, modern than the simple uh, map hot web stuff that I was showing before. Okay, now I'm create a simple table that has each player's game, yards thrown, and temperature. So I'm going to run a, a fairly simple analysis and try and correlate whether or not the 
temperature that the players play in is related to the amount of yards that they throw in a given game. So I pull out all of the quarterbacks, basically, that are thrown and um, the, team, the temperature that they played in. And then I pull through each of the um, each of the players, the number of games that they've played, and then I can simply leverage the correlation function. There's a ton of statistical uh, functions that are built into the Spark SQL language correlation, um, and I think it uses Pearson by default. Um, gives me a nice simple correlation where I can just pull the two columns and and determine whether or not a correlation exists between the passing yards and the temperature. And then I can group it by the players. And I spit all of that out into a table to make it easy to, um, to dump into Brunel. And here it is. So what the scatter chart shows is in zero would effectively mean there is no correlation between the temperature and the yards thrown. The size of the dot represents the number of games the players played. And then again, kind of for showing off the visualization capability, I can simply come in and hover over these to see, you know, Cutler, for example, at 0.07 with 81 games, um, we can effectively conclude the temperature doesn't impact him or Tom Brady for that matter. These guys are in the middle. And then you have these outliers like Cody um, Kessler or um, Boykin um, that are you know, arguably tremendously impacted by the temperature, whether it's um, colder temperatures or hotter temperatures that ultimately impact them. And obviously the, um, and I'll go through actually any, the, is one of them that I go through a little bit deeper. The size of the dot is also important because, you know, in two, say you had two games, then, um, in those two games, the, the correlation would probably be perfect because the temperatures would be different. Um, so these outliers with small dots don't mean a lot, but the outliers with slightly larger do. Okay, and then I can pull this into a table so we can visually just see the data. Um, Henny is a weird outlier, um, and I'll, I'll show that visualized in a second here. Um, and I think I pull Kessler as well. But you can get a sense of what the correlation is and the number of games that they've played in just a simple table. And then if we pull Cody Kessler, um, he had nine games and you can actually plot it and throw a normalized line at it to see whether or not the, or to kind of see the, uh, the linear relationship. So for some reason, um, as it gets warmer, he tends to throw more yards. And then another example here is Henny, a um, really weird one. Um, so Henny, for whatever reason, the warmer it gets, the less yards he throws in a given game. And that's it for the simple analysis one. And then for the Super Bowl stuff, um, basically what I did, I just pulled through Atlanta and New England in those same data sets just to kind of compare them. Um, you can see where this is kind of a nice trick. So I've got a couple of simple variables I set to those teams. And then when I write my SQL queries, I can simply format those and pass those team values. So it'd be very easy for me to go run an analysis between two different teams by just changing those team variables and everything below takes that into account. And then I also can pull through, in this example, I pulled through every game they played against each other. Um, unfortunately, it looks like New England has popped Atlanta in the three times they've played in the last five, six years. Um, we can do some simple visualization with that. Brayden, right, there's a question. Yep. Um, the question was, uh, should you be correlating the yards to the stadium played in and not the quarterback? yards to the stadium played in. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly, so So my analysis, my question, or my hypothesis, if you will, was are specific players impacted by the temperature? Um, it certainly would be interesting to see if temperature impacts all players, and then in that case, maybe it would be smart to jump into a, a stadium or something like that. Um, but yeah, good question. 
and an easy analysis to go run with the, the way that I have it built. It'd just be a simple select statement. Um, okay, so this was just to show kind of, again, a little bit of the depth of what we can do with the visualization. Um, so I'm pulling through um, a bunch of um, statistical data. So I've got, um, in this example, I just have their seasons. But it's pretty nice to be able to, you can come in and actually filter. So if I throw three of these charts together and I tell it to be interactive, I can actually select, so when I, and the colors are reversed, but I select Atlanta, it filters down the charts to show that. Um, this is their scores for those years, and New England does the same. Um, and then ultimately I can do the same thing across each season. And so this is showing overall passing yards for a given season, year for a given team. So just a nice, simple way to get down. Visualize. And then this one shows rushing yards in the bar and passing yards in the line graph. And again, I can just kind of filter down in here. Um, and you can see things like, like what I thought was mildly interesting about this one is um, Atlanta's rushing game kind of taking a, a big slump you know, four weeks ago, four, four game weeks ago, and then kind of rising back as they've gone through their playoffs. Um, New England almost exactly matching that same pattern. So um, some kind of interesting things to go through and run some, you know, compare these two teams. So nothing super profound on the Super Bowl. I don't have a winner other than to say um, New England certainly has the history of beating them. With that, that's kind of what we've got today. Hopefully you got a sense of what's possible with Spark, some of the visualization, some of the um, marrying of the multiple languages and uh, simple statistics capabilities. So, and with that, we have any questions? We don't have anyone's, any questions right now. Are there any more questions before we end the webinar? No, so thank you everyone and you will be receiving an email tomorrow that will include uh, links uh, to the information that, that we presented and to the recording. Uh, there's one question, Brayden, for you. Who do you think is going to win? <laughs> uh, I don't know as much think as hope that I'd love to see the Patriots get beat. So um, being a big Seahawks fan, I don't want to see them win. But, uh, other than that, I'm not sure I have a good winner based on the, the simple analysis I was able to do. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And right, thank you, Brayden. All right. Bye.